Can the CIA read your mind? The military people who started this whole program, they were looking for results. Some say our government has used psychics as spies for years. They didn't care how it worked. They just want to know if it worked. The U.S. espionage secret. Then, are people reliving past lives of Civil War soldiers? I belong in another time. A terrifying journey reveals the truth, the Civil War obsession, on the next sightings. the CIA read your mind. The military people who started this whole program, they were looking for results. Some say our government has used psychics as spies for years. They didn't care how it worked. They just wanted to know if it worked. The U.S. espionage secret on the next sightings. past lives of Civil War soldiers. I belong in another time. A terrifying journey reveals the truth, the Civil War obsession on the next sightings. I belong in another time. Are people reliving past lives of Civil War soldiers, the terrifying truth on sightings. people who started this whole program, they were looking for results. They didn't care how it worked, they just wanted to know if it worked. I belong in another time. people who started this whole program, they were looking for results. They didn't care how it worked, they just wanted to know if it worked. I belong in another time. I belong in another time. This edition of Sightings. In 1962, a UFO turned night into day in Eureka, Utah, then dramatically exploded over Las Vegas. The Air Force called it a meteor. I believe it was an object under intelligent control and just possibly not from around the neighborhood. Some of the men recreating these Civil War battles have done this before, over 125 years ago. I do feel that uh, I belong in another time. Find out why the CIA has spent over $20 million on psychics. They were looking for results. They didn't care how it worked. They just wanted to know if it worked. And obviously, they felt like it was working. And Sightings returns to Colorado's Black Forest for an eerie update to the Lee family haunting. Look at the eyes. See the eye? Look, the eyes, the nose. Look at that. There's a face there. <laughs> To sightings. I'm Tim White. On any given weekend in places throughout the country, you'll find them. 
people in vintage gray and blue uniforms, muzzle-loading rifles at their side, reenacting scenes from the American Civil War. For many, it's a hobby, a chance to bring alive our shared history. But for some, there is a paranormal dimension. They are reliving what they believe is a past life. It's eerie, it's strange. And I'm not saying for sure that I am he. But um, I do feel that uh, I belong in another time. For the past 26 years, Dave Kershwitz has devoted nearly every waking hour to the preservation of Civil War history. Dave is an avid collector of photographs. He maintains a personal 800-volume Civil War library and has turned his home into a private museum. Would you call your... Um fascination with the civil war period is it is it a hobby is it more than a hobby is it an obsession well it started out being a hobby and it has become more and more of an obsession it was his obsession that attracted the attention of psychotherapist barbara lane in her book echoes from the battlefield lane chronicles an experiment in which she hypnotized 12 civil war reenactors including dave Kershwitz. each person recalled a past life during the civil war remembering names and dates that were later verified as real it wasn't an intellectual experience it was an emotional experience that they had uh, some of them would even define it as a spiritual experience what drew you to these, these reenactments and these men? Uh, I sensed a, an incredible intensity about them, an incredible draw or link to the Civil War that I thought was beyond the normal. There must be somewhere in the neighborhood of, I would say, 20,000 people, not just in this country, but overseas as well, who feel compelled, drawn somehow, to reenact the American Civil War. Civil War historian Brian Pohanka helped Barbara Lane verify the minute details recalled during the past life study. The interesting thing about these, these hypnotic regressions, no matter what one chooses to believe, is that they, how vivid they were for the people who, who went through this. They came out somehow sobered, they came out somehow reflective, sad, uh, really as if they had gone through these experiences. During Dave Kerswitz's regression, he revealed himself to be James McNally, a soldier wounded during the Civil War. I'm hurt. I'm really hurt. My whole sleeve is covered in blood. Can you describe what you felt when, when she took you back through that, through being wounded? Uh, well, one thing I felt was pain. I felt pain in my arm. Some men dead. Some men dying. Arms. Legs. Some of the legs still shoes on. In my arm. No, Doc. No. Can't take it off. Later in that session, Pershwitz, believing himself to be wounded and unable to write, dictates a loving letter to his wife. My dearest, the heaviest fighting he's ever seen. And I was hit. The arms of my arm were shattered. They had to cut off my arm. It was, it was my left arm. Later research revealed that there was, in fact, a Union soldier named James McNally, who was wounded in the Battle of Piedmont. His left arm was amputated. He had a wife named Ellen. But the most amazing revelation of all was that James McNally was the great-grandfather of Dave Pershwitz. When you started doing reenactments, did you have any idea that your great-grandfather had actually participated in the Civil War? No, had no idea at all. I never knew that he was involved in any war at all. And uh, my grandmother pulled out a picture uh, at a family reunion. 
I almost felt like I was looking at a picture of myself. What do you make of all of it? The fact that in this regression, you came up with things that you had no previous knowledge of. I had not believed in um, um, reincarnation before, previous to this. But I almost have to um, put some credence in it now. Not to say exactly that I've been reincarnated, but um, I, I really have to wonder. Wonder about whether, in fact, you were your great-grandfather. Yeah, yeah. Another subject in the study, Robert Lee Hodge, has been obsessed with the Civil War since childhood. For his first grade school photo, he insisted on wearing a Civil War style cap. When I was nine years old and I went to Gettysburg, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Hodge is a hardcore reenactor, authentic down to the thread count of his undergarments. He believes through hypnosis he found a reason for his lifelong connection to another century. One of the first things she asked me was, what do you see? And the first thing that I thought of was trees. So I felt like I was an observer within somebody's mind or something. There was fighting, and there was uh, chaotic uh, commands given and carnage and bloodshed. And there was fear within myself. She had asked me for a name, and the only thing that I could think of was the name Jackson. And then she asked me, uh, can you think of a first name? And all I could think was a J, like James or John. Rob was a match uh, with a soldier by the name of uh, John Jackson, 47th Alabama. And uh, after, the, after his regression, I did go to the archives, and I did find a John Jackson, 47th Alabama. So, so what you're saying, in effect, is that Dave, very likely, was his great-grandfather. It's possible. It's entirely possible. And that Rob was a Civil War soldier. It could very easily be. For those who feel compelled to relive the Civil War over and over again, Lane believes that past life regression therapy can help create a lasting and final peace. I think that there still needs to be a tremendous amount of healing with the Civil War. It was a terrible thing for our country where brother fought brother. It was terribly emotional. And I think that this is one possible way of perhaps healing. Barbara Lane is now expanding her research into other historical reenactment groups. She's begun working with medieval reenactment societies to determine if they, too, may be reliving past lives. Next, how the CIA used psychics. Later, new cattle mutilations in California. And a UFO explodes over Las Vegas. The Central Intelligence Agency has an extraordinary arsenal of technology at its disposal. If they need to, in the name of national security, the CIA can read your license plate number from space, pick your face out of a crowd at the Super Bowl, even see through your bedroom wall. And with new experiments in psychic espionage, there may soon be no place to hide. Recent revelations about the Pentagon's multi-million dollar funding of psychic experiments has some people outraged and others wondering why it was so long in coming. The research focused on remote viewing, a technique in which psychics try to intuit strategic locations, viewing remote locations with the mind's eye only. We're going to do a movement exercise, meaning that we're going to move in to the target more. We want to go to a remote site and see what's there. Whatever is in a hidden room can really be revealed. Something should be visible. Brown, golden, rough, green. This is like opening a new door. This is like putting one foot off into another dimension. Jim Mars is an investigative journalist, among the first to disclose information about the CIA's attempt to emphasize the ESP in espionage. It was hard to crack the nut all the way through. The people who had actually participated in this remote viewing had all signed secrecy oaths. They all wanted to talk about the experience. They, you know, this is really something, you know. But they were constrained. Gentlemen, uh, With the consent of Congress, 
Psychic experiments received full funding for more than 20 years. And according to former remote viewers who must remain anonymous, there were successes. During the Iran hostage crisis, for example, remote viewers were able to describe the exact location where some hostages were being held. In 1982, when Brigadier General James Dozier was kidnapped by Italian terrorists, remote viewers helped guide anti-terrorist commandos to the building and even the room where Dozier was being held. The military people who started this whole program, they were looking for results. They didn't care how it worked. They just wanted to know if it worked. And obviously, they felt like it was working. It was during the Cold War in the 1960s that the potential for remote viewing first came to the attention of the American military, after intelligence reports revealed that Russia was already using psychic espionage effectively. This got the boys in the Pentagon going, you know, and, and their attitude was, well, we don't think there's anything to that, but if the Soviets are doing it, we've got to do it too. Early studies conducted at the Stanford Research Institute were crude and haphazard. Psychic Ingo Swan was among the first to be called into the program. When I first started in 1970, that control was sporadic. Some days, the experiments did not work. But as I became more professionally involved with research and began to understand the processes involved, the control was probably about 95% effective. As Swan's proficiency increased, so did his ability to analyze what worked and what didn't, and then teach remote viewing to military personnel. They, too, had a high success rate. The trained remote viewer, in my students anyway, had to be 85% correct 85% of the time. And they had to know when they were in error. You, you see, you can't take remote viewing and say, look, we can be successful 10% of the time or 20% because that's not competitive to other ways of getting information. But 85%, 95%, this is a whole different thing. Then Major Ed Dames was one of Swan's pupils. Ingo Swan's method allowed us to outperform even the best natural psychics that ever lived and to know when our data was correct. We took this discovery out of the laboratory, if you will, and we developed it into a militarily useful tool that could be used to support intelligence requirements in the event of a life or death situation or where a deadly force was, was necessary. News of the remote viewing success rate spread quickly, and by the mid-1970s, the program was part of the Army's Intelligence and Security Command. And within 10 years, psychic espionage was being used by several branches of the U.S. government. They were looking for Soviet submarines. They were locating uh, satellites. They were locating uh, biochemical warfare facilities, rocket launching sites. They even worked with other agencies. They participated in some programs looking for drug running ships. Even the CIA, uh, on more than one occasion, asked them to uh, try to see if they could locate moles penetrating agents uh, for an enemy power within the CIA. But in the late 1980s, an influx of new leadership changed the future of remote viewing. With the advent of the DIA, there was a civilian leadership that took over. And these people were ran the gamut from people who were just aghast that anybody was even looking at something so silly, uh, all the way to people who were just big believers. You know? And the first thing you know, they had channelers coming in. They had crystal ball gazers coming in. Uh, remote viewing got pushed ever further back into the background. The unit itself began to be used in less than honorable ways. Disillusioned, dames and others from the remote viewing unit left to form a private consulting firm, SciTech. According to dames, in 1991, during the Gulf War, SciTech was contacted by the NSC, the National Security Council and asked to psychologically locate Saddam Hussein's biological weapons facilities and to pinpoint the location of Libya's Muammar Gaddafi. Patty Dreyer was one of SciTech's professionally trained remote viewers. I would describe it as not being limited by time or space and to be able to gather information about a person, place, or thing, any time. It feels as though I'm in two places at the same time and yet I'm here writing information. So it's almost like a split of some kind. In some ways, it's as significant in terms of the evolution of man as the discovery of fire. 
the more people that learn these techniques and know how to do this or relearn it, perhaps man had these abilities and lost them at one time, the less secrets there will be. But just recently, the CIA released a report stating that remote viewing successes cannot be corroborated and recommending that the Pentagon pull the plug. This also comes into one of the aspects about the report that has just been made public by the CIA to the effect that, well, there seems to be some statistical basis for uh, the fact that something's happening there in remote viewing, but we really don't think there's much to it. And this comes back to the scientific problem, which is if they can't explain why it does something, then it can't be happening. But I think tip-off to the success of our program is the fact that it continued to be funded for a quarter of a century. So obviously somebody thought they were getting results from this. In response to a sightings inquiry regarding the CIA's use of paranormal espionage techniques, we received this letter. It concludes that, quote, remote viewing has not been shown to have value in intelligence operations. Next, Harvard University's latest attempt to contact ETs. And California ranchers confused about cattle mutilations. Here are some of the stories sightings is following in the news. The world's largest radio receiver is now online. It has more than 240 million channels, all tuned to outer space so that if E.T. phones home, we'll be able to listen in. At Harvard University's Oak Ridge Observatory, the most powerful radio receiver in the world is now up and running, and its sole purpose is to search for signs of intelligent life in outer space. Project Beta, which stands for the Billion Channel Extraterrestrial Assay is the latest venture from the Planetary Society, a private group of space scientists and dreamers. What's happening now is the installation of Beta, the Billion Channel Extraterrestrial Assay, in which a whole new receiver is being installed with a very modern uh, computer technology. This is, a, I think, a, ma a major milestone in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The Beta radio telescope system can scan two billion radio channels in less than a second. Each channel is then analyzed for distinctive patterns that might indicate the signal is from an intelligent source in another part of the universe. We finally have evidence that there are planetary systems out there and that they, indeed they may even be the rule rather than the exception. We're undoubtedly not unique in this universe. Of 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars, things don't happen just once. There's undoubtedly other advanced life in our galaxy. And if it has grown up anything like the way we've grown up, it probably likes communicating. For the Planetary Society, the question is not, is there intelligent life out there? But rather, will we be able to recognize their signal when it comes through? It will just sit here and monitor things on its own. Uh, it's very sophisticated, and it will let us know uh, when something has been discovered. In Lassen County, California, a string of bizarre animal deaths have ranchers here confused, frightened, and angry. Add grazing land in Lassen National Forest to the list of places where cattle are being mutilated in unexplainable, seemingly ritualistic ways, and these deaths fit a 30-year pattern. I've heard about it because it's happened in the last 20 years all over the United States, but I certainly never expected it to happen to me. But it did happen when ranchers Bill and Jean Barton recently found three of their herd butchered in typical fashion. The animal's genitals, tongues, udders, and ears had been removed with surgical precision. There were no tracks, neither paw prints nor footprints, anywhere near the bizarre carcasses. But something did leave these large circular depressions in the tall meadow grass near the mutilation site. It's just something that I, I can't and explain and until somebody finds out why or investigates it and gives us an answer why. So far, local law enforcement agencies are saying little about the string of mutilations, only that the cattle were most likely killed by predators. 
There's no way that the cattle could have been killed by anything in nature and then had the parts taken off as precision-like as they were. Therefore, I think we have to look to something either from our own government for top secret research or possibly into the sky. I believe possibly the government may even be doing this or assisting extraterrestrials in this. And I think we are being blatantly lied to. Since the first reported mutilation in 1967, there have been more than 12,000 strange animal deaths reported in 20 states. I think we'd like to find the answer for all the cattle in the country. In Miami, Florida, at the headquarters of the Survival Research Foundation, Director Arthur Berger is attempting to develop scientific proof of life after death. The case for life after death has not been proved one way or the other. The matter remains a dead center, and our belief is that only investigations and further facts can move it in one way or the other. Berger, a retired attorney, heads up the foundation which has an international constituency, including several prominent scholars and scientists. The 100-plus membership believes that one way they may prove life after death is if members leave a complicated coded message that can only be solved if they speak from the grave to break the code for researchers. This is secret writing. This is the kind of writing that James Bond would use because nobody can read it without knowing the key. And for the first time, we're using it in a life after death experiment. The project is based on a similar experiment conducted by a British psychologist who left a coded message when he died 10 years ago. Recently, a cryptographer made headlines when he broke the code using computer technology. While Berger was disappointed, he said it won't happen again. We keep all of our test messages now under lock and key, and no one will have access to them to make trials on them, except researchers involved in the project. And Berger hopes that through this coded message project, humankind's greatest question will finally be answered. If we could prove that there was life after death, it would have terrific implications for philosophy, science, medicine, most of all, for people who are bereaved. It would reduce their grief, and that to me is justification enough for conducting this program. We'll have more stories from the news next time. Now, here's what's coming up on Sightings. First, it lit up the night sky all over the West. Then, it exploded over Las Vegas. Now, the Air Force wants us to believe it was just a meteor. Later, it's called Candomblé, and its practitioners are possessed by spirits. In 1962, a brilliant UFO was tracked across the United States from New York to Nevada. It may very well have been the largest mass sighting of an extraterrestrial object in U.S. history. And when it finally came to rest, it had crashed in the military's own backyard. It raced across the sky over the tiny mining town of Eureka, Utah on April 18, 1962. And high school buddies Dave Redmond and Jerry Sanderson were there to see it. We had gone for a ride. Jerry was, was a, senior a senior in high school. In high school. Uh, and that night, we were uh, probably just driving up and down Main Street, which is what we did mostly. And we stopped at the east end of the Main Street in Eureka pulled off the road and we're sitting there. First thing I remember about the incident was the, the light. light. It was a bright light that lit up the entire sky from horizon to light horizon. That I could see the mountain across the valley and see the trees on that mountain, see the sagebrush. The unearthly light flooded the night sky and startled Eureka residents. A light so bright it turned off the street lights by triggering their photoelectric cells and a few people had encounters that were a little too close for comfort. When he got home, he looked like he had seen a ghost. Betty Robinson describes the harrowing experience her late husband Bob endured on the way home from a hunting trip with a friend. They were outside the, the truck, and they could hear this noise. 
And they stood there for a few seconds and listened. It kept getting louder and louder, and he said it was just a very, very whooshing noise. Just whoosh, 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 but just deafening. Unsure what was bearing down on them, the men dove under Bob's truck. When they got out of the truck, they had left the motor running. And as the object started to approach them, the, the headlights started to dim, and the motor began to sputter. As the object passed over, everything returned to normal. All they wanted to do was hurry up and get home, and get away from it, because they didn't know if it was coming back. According to many eyewitness accounts, the UFO headed west and was soon spotted over Reno, Nevada. Just minutes later, it was over Las Vegas, Nevada. Then it suddenly burst into flames, very near Nellis Air Force Base. More than 1,000 people witnessed the explosion. Fighters were scrambled from Nellis in Las Vegas, Luke near Phoenix, Arizona. The object uh, was tracked on radar, both surveillance radars and height finding radars. And that's important. It's on two separate kinds of radar, so you don't have weather-related phenomena. You have a real solid object. Kevin Randall is an author and UFO researcher who maintains that the Air Force deliberately tried to make the Eureka sightings and the Nellis explosion look like two separate events. The problem we have with this sighting, with the paperwork, is the Air Force did a very clever thing. They labeled the sightings in Utah using Zulu time, adding six hours to it. They labeled the sightings in Las Vegas using the local time. So what it appears is we have a sighting that took place over a period of hours in two separate locations on two separate days, two distinct events. What really happened was we have a single event that took place over a space of about 16 minutes from the Eureka end of the sightings until it is seen to explode over Las Vegas. But according to the United States Air Force, the object that streaked over Eureka and Reno was a bolide meteor, a rare but explainable event. Information about the Nellis UFO was deemed insufficient for analysis. One, they dismiss as an astronomical phenomena, a bolide, which doesn't come down to the ground and take off again and do turns. And the other one, they said there was insufficient evidence to really categorize the sighting, that there was no visual sightings, which is incorrect. If you just look at the headline of the Las Vegas paper the next day, that negates that. Mark Farmer is a former naval intelligence agent and an expert in secret military weapon systems. He has conducted his own investigation into the events surrounding the spectacular sightings of April 18, 1962. I estimate that this was traveling more than 2,000 miles an hour at times because it had to slow down, come low, and it took off, and then the amount of time that elapsed and the amount of distance it was covered, it was going very fast. We can pretty much rule out most existing uh, aircraft and missiles at that time. Months after the Nellis explosion, the Air Force Office of Public Information issued this statement, suggesting that the UFO was probably a U-2 spy plane or a weather balloon. They did say in their report that it, the crack on the radar seemed to reflect a U-2 or a balloon, and the question becomes, what kind of radar operator couldn't tell the difference between a balloon drifting at the whim of the winds and an intelligently controlled U-2 aircraft? So they were just throwing something out. But why would the Air Force go to such extremes to mislead the public? The Air Force has been charged with keeping our skies clear of enemy craft. If they can't stop UFOs, then they clearly can't do their mission. Why should they be funded with billions of dollars when they cannot do the mission they're charged with doing? The object that flew across the United States on the night of uh, April 18th, 1962, uh, I don't believe was an errant Russian missile or one of our weapons. I believe it was an object under control, intelligent control, and just possibly not from around the neighborhood. The UFO crash near the Nellis test range seems to indicate that the government's don't ask, don't tell policy also applies to information about UFOs. Next, why this woman is being drawn back to Candomblé. Later, a frightening revelation about a haunting in Colorado's Black Forest. Some of the most beautiful cathedrals in the world can be found in Brazil, where more than 135 million people are Catholic. But in the region of Salvador de Bahia, in northeastern Brazil, a strange brew of African religion, magic, and theater is gaining thousands of new converts every year. It's called 
Candomblé. It is known as Brazilian voodoo, but Candomblé has a power all its own. For hundreds of years, it was practiced in secret because followers were forbidden by the Brazilian government to even speak its name. To the uninitiated, Candomblé conjures up images of demonic possession, animal sacrifice, and evil curses. But to thousands of devotees inside Brazil today, the mysterious rituals of Candomblé represent obedience to a higher power, the power of magic. May Lucia is a high priestess of one of Brazil's most traditional candomblé temples. In her outdoor compound, there are shrines dedicated to several different African deities called orishas, deities who can curse but also cure. It's an open thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's about nature. It's about nature. As we destroy the environment, and we suddenly we discover an ancient religion that can be traced back through legend to the Stone Age that believes that nature is a force and that the Orishas are forces to be respected. Sabrina Gledon is a Canadian national who has lived in Brazil for nine years, working as a teacher and translator. Four years ago, Sabrina was initiated as a candomblé priestess dedicating herself to the deity Oshun, the goddess of fertility and fresh water. I became interested in candomblé because I think I've always been interested in finding a religion that really had something to do with me. Many people are beginning to see ancient religions as something very fresh and new and relevant to them. After two years of intense dedication to her orisha, Sabrina stopped visiting the temple. But now, two years later, a series of personal setbacks have brought her back to Candomblé for spiritual focus and, hopefully, some answers. Well, I stopped going basically because I'm a single mother. I'm um, divorcing my ex-husband, and uh, I was suddenly overwhelmed by the pressures of life and work. Uh, and being a priestess of Candomblé is a lot of work. It's a lot of responsibility. Sabrina says she feels there is a deep void in her life and returns to her mentor, May Lucia, for guidance. May Lucia takes Sabrina to a special room dedicated to her sacred shells called Buzios. By reading the pattern of the shells, May Lucia believes she can foretell the future and help Sabrina choose the right path. It's been a long time since I've gone to a temple and I feel that I left many things undone. I must do them and I would like you to see what I have to do to please my Orishas. Open the roads. Ocean, as you should know, is the mother Orisha. Mother already says it all. Mother is a word that needs no definition, but mother is the one that punishes children, that gives children discipline. Mother is the one who says how we should live. If not, we wouldn't all have a mother to guide us. The shells also tell Sabrina that her goddess, Oshun, is unhappy with her absence from worship. And this is why she has had so many struggles recently. May Lucia tells Sabrina she must ask the deity's advice in a ceremony that very night. If the spirits say, hey, you need to do this, usually it's pretty good advice to follow. Patrick Polk is a folklorist at the University of California, Los Angeles, who has studied candomblé. One of the fundamental reasons for the existence of candomblé as a religion is to give people a way of making sense out of their life and to connect to the divine. This direct connection to the divine is achieved through spirit possession and is precisely why candomblé has been feared and outlawed in the past. Practitioners willingly succumb to their deities and believe these gods have the power to enter their bodies and transform their fate. And the ultimate expression of divinity in man's connection to the divine is in spirit possession, where in a ceremony, in a ritual, a divine being, a god, a saint, an ancestor, literally comes and possesses the body of the worshiper. It's an experience like levitation, understand? 
When the Orisha takes over the body, then the Orisha possesses us. It's as if we were sleeping. We don't recognize what is going on because she takes over our body. This is the evening ceremony in Salvador de Bahia that May Lucia has asked Sabrina to attend. Sabrina is here, but she is apprehensive. I already had a feeling, sort of a premonition, that my Orisha would manifest itself. And I know very well that if my Orisha were to appear, that it would be asked very nicely to go away. One by one, the priestesses begin to show signs that their spirit possession has begun. The women are led off to a separate dressing area where they put on special clothing. A different costume is reserved for each deity. When they return to the ceremony, no one is dressed as the Orisha Oshun. Then, suddenly, Oshun appears. May Lucia sees her inside the body of Sabrina. In a strange trance state, Sabrina is led outside, and the spirit is exorcised in a private ceremony. When Sabrina comes out of the strange altered state of consciousness, she tells May Lucia that an inner voice is telling her that she has an important task to perform. The next morning, Sabrina visits a sacred lake consecrated to the goddess Oshun. She prays for peace and protection. Someone told me that I had to take care of my mother, meaning my Orisha. And I realized that that was a message, perhaps, that I had gone there to receive, that I had been neglecting my Orisha and that I needed to start taking care of her again. According to a recent survey, every year more than half a million Brazilian Catholics are converting to other religions, including Candomblé. And in fact, in Salvador de Bahia today, there are 300 colonial churches and more than 3,000 voodoo temples. Next, psychic Peter James reflects on what's haunting the Lee family. The mirror is a verification that this was, in fact, a pathway. The haunting activity in Stephen Beth Lee's Colorado home is continuing to plague them and their two young sons. Recently, we brought a sightings team to the Lee home and let our online users plug directly into the investigation. For the past year, Sightings has made several trips to the small, picturesque town of Black Forest, Colorado, to this beautiful log home. Because inside, a strange force has appeared again and again, haunting the Lee family, and even one member of the Sightings investigative team. On previous visits, we recorded strange physical effects from the haunting, and now return to the home with psychic Peter James and a worldwide live hookup with Sightings viewers online if someone commits suicide is their spirit necessarily still around i believe if someone commits suicide or dies tragically that they're rendered earthbound so i would say yes in answer to their question peter james fielded questions from over 400 online users and it was one particular question that seemed to set into motion a new encounter with the source of the haunting activity is this vortex caused by a rip in the ethereal and primal plane causing the two to merge? No, I don't believe that. I feel that this vortex is the result of a habitual pathway that these entities used since around the turn of the century and continue using this pathway. Peter first discovered this so-called vortex on a previous visit he made to the Lee home. He felt this rip in the fabric of reality most strongly in the master bedroom and also identified a spirit there named Howard, a man thought to have died under suspicious and tragic circumstances. We're talking murder. Yeah. And this is what I really feel why he's here and why he's trying to convey this message to me now. This time, Peter's attempts to find the spirit vortex again led him inevitably into the master bedroom and a mirror above the dresser. Look, you see almost at the top now, look. See, the, look, the, look at the eyes. Right where the light is shining into the, into the, see it? See it, see the eye, look, the eyes, the nose, look at that. There's a face there. 
Peter suggests that the mirror is somehow reflecting the spirits who are flowing in and out of the room's vortex. It's an idea that's hard to accept, but after Polaroid pictures shot into the mirror are enhanced with a special computer program, human forms are visible. If you take out this real bright spot right here in the middle, mm -hmm. there is actually faces back behind, yes, behind yes. that that right there and it's like there's layered if you peel the layers away yes. there's like another hundred or so faces yes. on each layer for yes. about three layers the mirror is a verification that this was in fact a pathway and the mirror is reminding them that they were here and they're looking for the life force that they lost somewhere and they found it seemingly within the mirror but the enhanced photographs cannot answer the big question that continues to plague this investigation. Why this place? What is it about this house, the environment inside and out, that seems to welcome unearthly forces? There is an energy here unlike any that I've ever experienced in all the years that I've investigated anomalous activity. So the Black Forest is indeed a, a very uh, ominous place that should be further investigated because I feel that we're approaching the area that may uncover a mystery here. The Sightings Online area is available only to America Online subscribers, but if you have a question, comment, or suggestion for the Sightings team, you can still reach us by conventional mail. Ghosts. UFOs. The unexplained, dramatic stories of the paranormal from the files of Sightings, a new paperback book available now wherever books are sold from Fireside Books. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For Sightings, I'm Tim White.